Okay, everybody, let's try that one again, shall we? <laughs> Hello. <laughs> this is, I think, attempt three at this particular live stream. Good morning again, everybody. I am Megan Lewis um, with Digital Hammurabi, and today I am talking to Dr. Jonathan Taylor, um, who is a curator at the British Museum uh, and looks after their cuneiform collection. Uh, he's very kindly agreed to come and talk to us about what he does. Um, and has been very patient throughout our delightful technological glitches. So we're going to try this again. Um, Dr. Taylor, thank you very much for joining me. And again, I'm so sorry about exactly how long this is taking to get going. Um, so before uh, the computers exploded, uh, we started talking about uh, your background and how you got into the field of Assyriology. Would you mind possibly for the third time today going into that again? <laughs> Sure. No, it's a pleasure to, to be with you. Morning, everyone. So um, I was saying there's, there's two answers to this. There's the short one, which is the one that everyone probably wants, but it's not very helpful. So the short one is that uh, my journey is dumb luck. It's a series of accidents because, you know, if you'd have bumped into a young me as a schoolboy and said, what do you want to do when you grow up? I wouldn't have said this. I don't know quite what I would have said, but it wouldn't have been this. The longer answer is that basically there's no such thing as luck, is there? What you've got is the result of a whole series of choices, some of which you have influence on, some of which you don't. So in my case, I was always interested in history, and I like ancient history, and I like the Romans. And uh, where I'm coming from is that uh, in, in my family, I'm, I'm part of the first generation to stay on in education after 16. So there's not a lot of guidance. So what my family said was, do what interests you. It, uh, excuse me, it's the difference between you know, waking up in the morning and thinking, oh, no, I've got to go to work. It's all right, I'll survive till five o'clock. Here we go again. Or, you know, oh, good, today's going to be an interesting day. So already chase what, what you want to do. So when I got to towards school leaving age, I don't know if this works in American schools, but in British schools, it's quite normal to go and work experience. So you go off to a local organization and you know, experience what the real world's like in a sector that's something like what you might want to go into. So for me, I had two. One was in the local museum, you know, a very small town museum where I helped with a bit of inventory work of natural history collections. Okay, very good experience. The other one was with the county archaeologists. So I got to see some excavation, again, sort of the sites and sort of the office space work. And then I got to like a bonus one because one of my dad's friends bumped into him one day and said, oh, oh by the way, your boy's interested in history, isn't he? Do you know there's an excavation just starting down the road? Because we lived in a small village in the middle of nowhere in, in the southwest, which happened to be along the course of a Roman road. And a group of archaeologists were starting a new dig. And they'd hired my dad's friend as the driver of the digger to take the topsoil off so they could get down to the archaeology. And he had the, you know, the thought, the compassion to say, you know, you know, your boy might be interested. So my dad arranged that I could go and volunteer which is a great experience. I got to learn, you know, how to drink industrial strength tea out of the months <laughs> and key skills like that. But what those three things gave me was a more rounded appreciation of the past and how landscapes and those features and this stratigraphy and this context. And you learn what happens after the objects come out of the ground and you learn sort of right to the end of the process in terms of public engagement with the results of your work. So that put me in a slightly different place. But at this point, I'm still a million miles from where I currently am. So the next step was, you know, because we lived in a small village, from time to time we go to the nearest town just for a break, and, you know, do something different, have a look at the big shops. And I always like to go to a, a bookshop. So I had a Saturday job, which gave me a few pounds, not much, but I could afford books in this shop. And I go along and buy books about castles and Vikings and whatever. But then one day I came across this. You can all see that. This is Harry Sags is the might that was Assyria. And I looked at that and I thought, well, first of all, what's Assyria? And who's that funny bloke on a horse? And I sort of picked it, this is in the wrong section. So, you know, you're used to Egyptians and Romans. You, you kind of, you pick up the iconography. It's familiar, but then you, you see that and it's a different world. So I got it and I read it. And from that point, I kind of knew that that's where I wanted to go. But still, how do I actually go and study that? Mm -hmm. The other part was that at my school, our biology teacher, as it happened, had a second job as the careers advisor. He was a great guy. He was very uh, interested in, in you as an individual, and he wanted to volunteer, so I went to volunteer. And 
my job was at one lunchtime a week, I had to sit in this little office with a filing cabinet. And what was in the filing cabinet was a series of prospectuses from universities. I had to keep them up to date, get rid of the old ones, make sure they're in the right place. I guess it's a good kind of museum type job. And to help people find what they want. So I got to go through them and try and find the word Assyria in the list of university courses you could study. And of course, you can't find that. So I. No. <laughs> given my job, the first thing is yeah, how do you find out, A, that this place exists? and that you can study it. So eventually I, I, I sussed that. So I ended up going to the University of Birmingham. Which Me too. To the, Sorry. It's the best place. <laughs> it, it happened to be the, the place where the archaeologists whose dig I joined had come from. So I thought, okay, they're friendly, but mm. this is clearly meant to be. And I guess you, you must have uh, been a student of Alistair. I was, yes. Excellent. So you maybe appreciate what, what I'm about to say next. So... For me, what I liked about it was you do a little bit of everything and you get a bit of the, a bit of the history, a bit of the archaeology, mm-hmm. a bit of prehistory, whatever. And then you can specialise off. And we had in the first year the survey course and Alistair Livingstone is up there and he's, this is in the days where you're still chalkboards. So there's a big lecture theatre, a great long chalkboard across the front up on the stage. And he's there, he's writing out, you know, you know Hammurabi and Nippur or whatever. He gets to Ziggurat and he's near the end of the chalkboard. And he's right, his ziggurat, and of course, we have to say, okay, the Akkadian for that is a Korra tool, and here it is in Sumerian, and maybe there's an Arabic cognate of something. I was going to say, did he give it to you in Swahili as well? Yeah, a little bit. <laughs> Quite often. I think he's got to the end of the blackboard, but he's on a roll, and he's got this energy, he wants to tell you things, so what's he going to do? So obviously what he gets, what he does, he comes off the stage, walks down to the wall, and starts chalking on the wall, draws a picture of a ziggurat. And, you know, that kind of, that, that passion, that immersiveness in the subject is kind of, it's contagious and it kind of sucks you in from yeah. that point of view. Okay, not getting ahead of this one. And I guess I had a, another stroke of luck in that the, the previous lecturer was Wilfred Lambert, you know, mm. a great towering figures of Assyriology. He's retired, he didn't need to, to do anything, but he gave up his Friday afternoons for whoever was going to suffer this intense course. You know, it was really intimidating figure but very kind and a fantastic teacher and so we spent a few years reading texts with, with Lambert and I suppose the, the, the other missing pieces are that part of Alistair's interest of course were, were objects so you'd sit there in class and you read a brick you read the actual object that these inscriptions are on and you talk about them and you take them to museums and show you around so by the end of the first semester doing your Sumerian you mean you start off completely lost and you walk through the galleries of a big museum, point at an object, and you can actually read a real yeah. inscription. Do you know what I mean? So that, that kind of gets you over the hill and think, right, okay, I'm, I might actually get some. I can keep going with this. Yeah. <laughs> ah, yeah. It, very reassuring. When, you know, he starts off saying, oh, by the way, there isn't Dick Sherman Academic Exchange Service. I went to, to Germany for a year, and whilst I was there in the semester break, uh, I arranged a placement at the Near East Museum in Berlin, so I got to spend a month in the tablet collection in Berlin, so that gave me a, a sense of sort of how that works. And then, you know, the lucky break comes, you know, you, you hand in your PhD. In my case, I was very lucky because it, I forget quite what the exact timings were, but it was more or less handing in on a Friday, start work at a new project on Monday. Mm-hmm. So I went to Oxford for the, the Sumerian Literary uh, Project. I went back to Birmingham for a paleography project to get me a bit more responsibility. But then this job came up at the museum. I went for it, got it, and then that's essentially how I got it. <laughs> I mean, it's, it, it. In a way, it's kind of luck, but the, I say it's nothing to do with luck because it's people taking the time and effort to do things that they really don't have to do mm-hmm. and to make the sacrifice. Like to take someone as a volunteer is actually uh, quite a commitment from a a curator, so I understand why people in in regional museums really can't do it very much. So I owe a lot to all of these people along the line, these, you know, your inspirational teachers, all of the people who took me for placements. Mm -hmm. Everybody has sort of gone a little bit above and beyond. And and if it's not for that kind of thing, at any stage, you've got to drop through the the gaps, don't you? You you go off your your entire history, takes a completely different tangent. So Wonderful. That's the, the long answer. I, that's an excellent the answer. There, is that, you know, you've got to give people a, you know, a chance. Here. And you really do. And I just, uh, 
yeah, Alistair Livingston was fantastic. Um, and I, like you is the reason, well, not like you, because you were in Assyriology to begin with, but um, is the reason I got into Assyriology particularly, because I did um, ancient history at Birmingham. Um, by planning on being a classicist, I did classics at high school. Um, and it was through long meetings with Alistair over 8 million cups of tea um, that I was just really enthralled by Mesopotamia and his passion for it and, and how much work there was still to do. Um, so yes, greatly indebted to people like that who take the time with undergraduates and high school students to, to share their passion with them. Sure, yeah. yeah. Thank you. Um, so um, can you tell us a bit about your day-to-day -day duties as a cur curator? Because it's something I have absolutely no knowledge of um, and I'd be very interested to hear about it. Right. Well, I suppose the, the best bit is that there isn't a normal day. <laughs> it's fairly unpredictable. So I don't think I've yet had a day where I think, okay, today these things are going to happen and that's actually what happened. <laughs> um, you know, in a way, it's frustrating that you can't plan your time quite like that. But it's also good because it's always fresh. You know I mean? mm -hmm. So I suppose, in theory, what happens is that you you have a number of major projects that will occupy most of your time. So you might have, say, a display project, which could be an exhibition, so like the, the recent Ashbanapal temporary exhibition, or it could be one of the, the galleries. You might do a, a refresh of one of the permanent displays. Uh, that might be a cataloging project. So recently, you know, we published a, a print catalog of the Cassite seals. You know, anything like that will take you a, a good chunk of time. Mm -hmm. There are you know, digitization projects, training projects. Uh, we supervise what are called uh, collaborative doctoral awards students, which are kind of PhDs joint between a university and museums. So you have like a foot in both camps. You get both sets of skills. So mm -hmm. that, that's a major commitment. We do things like we will uh, work with law enforcement authorities. So if they intercept something at you know, customs, say, that looks a bit dodgy, they'll contact us. We'll try and supply the expertise to say, OK, yes, this is ancient. This probably comes from Iraq and we'll kind of take it down the line. And so we, you know, in the last few months, we've had a couple of successes in that we've been able to help return objects mm -hmm. to Iran, you know, the Kaduru and mm -hmm. objects. Return. So that's the kind of thing that happens across the museum. Uh, what else do we do? Obviously, we do research. That can that can be quite a big component. Then on top of that, you get like the, the more kind of daily tasks, much smaller, more con contained things. But it's things like uh, public inquiries. So uh, you know, if someone wants to know something about the Sumerians, or if they have an object that their, their grandparents uh, passed down to them who were there in Iraq in the 1920s or something, picked it up in the market in Baghdad. Mm -hmm. What is it? And we can. You know, a, lot, a lot of that kind of thing. Fantastic. They found an image and they want a high res version. So, what you get is just an image with no information, no number. <laughs> you have to, work on you have to go and find in it. In the British Museum to start with. So, there's a bit of detective skills, or you'd be in the Great Court with a bunch of, you know, a lump of clay teaching kids how to write their name. You could be giving a talk somewhere. You could be meeting, you know, uh, you know the Minister of Culture of wherever it is. You'd be out uh, at the university being an external examiner. You're talking to a newspaper, and there's all sorts of things, and then on top of that, you get the kind of the normal administrative tasks. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I supervise you know, the, the volunteers in the department, the website, the AIDS, and there's going to health and safety or department lectures, or you know, a hundred different committees that spring up. You could do a bit of that as well. Wow. So, it's this incredible mix of all sorts of things, talking to all kinds of people, anything to do with your collection. So, that, that's kind of the fun, but it keeps you on your toes. You, know I mean? you must never ever get bored. Rarely. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, I mean, there's a, as I say, there's a lot of some of the jobs are quite repetitive, but you bear in mind kind of the, the long term goal. So, if you're doing an inventory or sometimes some of the cataloging or mm. whatever it is, repetitive, not very challenging things, and you've got another thousand, ten thousand to go, it takes a bit of willpower, but you, yeah. At the end of that, you know, this is going to be a useful resource. You've got to hang in there, you do a bit, do something else, come back. So, you know, 
yeah, there is value in this. Even though I've been yeah. sitting at a computer for eight hours straight doing data entry, there is still value in it. <laughs> yes, somebody somewhere will look at this and be thankful. They won't know who you are, how you've done it, but they will know that somebody has done it. They'll be glad that someone did it. <laughs> yes, so, life will be better. How much time do you get to spend on your own personal research interests? Uh, that depends. That depends. So museums don't function in quite the same way as, as universities in this regard, in that we're not subject to the, the assessment procedures. Mm -hmm. We don't get funding through the same channels like that. But we are a research organisation. We do pull in funding from a number of streams. And, you know, of course, there's a strategy with various research groups and things. But um, the kinds of research we do are obviously much more focused on the collection. So rather than me uh, researching Sumerian grammar, which you could do anywhere on the planet, mm -hmm. we do something that's very much focused on uh, developing museums' goals so we can understand a bit of the collection better, explain this, understand the history of that. Or uh, kind of things that I like to do is to take advantage of the privilege I've got in that I can just go downstairs, theoretically open a cupboard and pick up an object and I can see, you know, a hundred objects, I can see a thousand objects. I get that kind of overview mm -hmm. that it's very hard to get if you're a normal researcher and you just come, you've got three days, you get 45 objects, say. I get to see much more. Also in the course of my other jobs, I get to work with the collection. I don't have time to read the text because that's not what the point of the job is, but mm -hmm. you know, you get to see them, you get to notice things. And you think, OK, well, that's a, a useful thing. I better write that up. And you don't always get time during your, your curatorial day. So quite often I will do that on my own time. So for, for, in my case, I commute to work on the train. Mm -hmm. so I've got two hours a day where I have to sit on a train. I hate trains, but it gives me two hours a day in which I can do something. So what I tend to do is I might read a book or something, but quite often I'll, I'll have taken uh, you know, kind of research data and I'll start to write it up and do something like that. Mm -hmm. it, no time. So it's kind of a mix. But obviously, if you've got a research project, you'll have, say, 30% of your time allocated or, or something like mm -hmm. that. It's, it's very variable. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. That's... I had wondered, actually, before we spoke, if you were... Um if your, your research would like focus more on the university's hold at the university, the museum's holdings, than just more ephemeral topics maybe um so that's very interesting thank you yeah. um so when you're doing things like um researching and preparing for a major exhibition like the ashurbanipal one um i'm assuming that involves a tremendous amount of people um and is it must be a an absolute work of genius to get all the different moving parts together what's the like can you walk us through the very basic process you wouldn't believe how many people are involved in it um so don't think of it in terms of of you know a curator and a few helpers that's mm. not how it works at all it's think of it more as a, a kind of network with the curator as one of the key nodes so what will happen is that someone will have an idea for an exhibition you know a few years out and it will be sort of roughed out and we'll go up through various stages of approval and eventually we'll get to the stage where okay yes we're, we want to provisionally at least proceed with that flesh mm. it out a little bit more so you could be at this stage you know three four years out from when it would actually happen mm -hmm. then when it gets a bit further down the line and we're fairly sure it's 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 a go you might get maybe two years out you might do some intensive curatorial research mm -hmm start to then think about key objects that you, you want. If there's a, a loan, you need to get something from Paris, say, flag up very early that that's the kind of thing. Is it actually going to be possible to borrow it at all? You need to know, but you know, very early on. Mm -hmm. So maybe two years, 18 months out, you'll have the, the key loans lined up and your basic framework lined up. By about maybe 15 months out, it's pretty much in place. You have the themes that you're going to cover sorted. Your objects will be more or less done and in groups. You've got the catalogue underway. Kind of 12 months out, it's getting pretty close. Mm -hmm. This is <laughs> this is where people start sweating. So it kind of goes up to high level review just to make sure, yes, this really is going to go ahead. 
it will work. It's viable. It, mm-hmm. The shape that you currently got it. We're happy with what you're saying, how you're saying it, what you're using. It. So then the designers will come on board in a, in a big way. There'll be a lot of intensive design work. The interpretation team will come on to help you uh, decide specifically what messages you really want to focus on and how you can articulate that in words that people will understand. And there'll be you know evaluation groups. They'll get uh, representative groups of non-specialists in we'll mm-hmm. give them, you know we'll say do you know who Ashbanapal is and does this make sense are you interested in that just to get a sense that this is you know a meaningful thing to do then say uh, I guess maybe sort of eight months out it's pretty much in place six months out already there's kind of mock-ups of what it's going to look like mm-hmm. final tweaks then things are going to start to be built off site and then when the, the previous exhibition comes down, you know, a couple of months out, you get like a month of build, maybe three, four weeks of install, and then bang, you hit the ground running. Mm-hmm. And all the while this is going on, you will be out there talking to key stakeholders, say, you know, maybe the sponsor. Um, you will be dealing with marketing, so somebody's got to decide what to call the exhibition. Mm-hmm. There's lots of people have input because it has all sorts of implications. You've got to... You know, work with uh, the BM you know, company, you know, what we sell in the shop, what kind of books would be interesting, what kind of products are out there. Sometimes you have to make new ones, you help with design, make sure that, you know, if you write cuneiform, it doesn't say nonsense. It says, you know, yep, because <laughs> someone will check it. <laughs> yeah, someone will check it, yeah. Uh, when you need the events calendar, there's all sorts of talks, there'll be community events where you put up all of that, and of course there are specialists around the museum were, were leading on that but as the curator you could kind of get dragged from a to b doing this and suddenly the deadline you have to do this by then that by then so the, kind of the last year leading up to opening is quite an intensive time mm-hmm. that, that's roughly no th- thank you and i i appreciate that uh, <laughs> it's a very big and complex question but just having a like a, a rough outline of what happens is is yeah. is very yeah, interesting. It's kind of like the, the iceberg principle. And the bit you can see is just a tiny aspect of the bit you imagine is happening. And so, you know, for those three months of, of blossoming behind it, there's good, you know, three, four years yeah. of work. And on top and of that... Thousands of hours. I mean, you didn't even mention the conservators. Yeah. Quite often there's, you know, scientific research. So for the Ashurbanipal exhibition, the conservators put in fa- literally thousands of hours of work to get those objects looking their best. Mm-hmm. They and they did a spectacular job, yeah. and of course, on on top of all of the preparations, you're still carrying on with everything else you have to do as a curator. Yeah, you get a little bit of respite, but not much. Yeah, that's an enormous undertaking. Yeah, so usually when you can tell who's just done an exhibition opportunity, but it, it really is demanding, and it, it means a lot of early mornings, late nights, mm-hmm. weekends, and this and that. And it, it's it's a big commitment. Yeah. Sounds it. Um, so we have, with our technology issues, been going for nearly an hour. So I have one more question, um, and then I think we'll let you go. Um, we have no questions from the chat, but everyone is saying that this is very interesting. So thank you very much. Um, what is your absolute favourite part of working in the British Museum? Wow, wow, wow. Well, I guess it's it's partly this variety. Mm-hmm. You know, I mean, the unpredictability that you have to deal with everything. But it's also, you know, working with the collection itself, rather than just opening a book and reading the words, you get that little stage further. You actually handle the objects. Or, you know, you're, you're working all the time with you know, the real thing. Mm-hmm. That's that's a special privilege. And it's great to be able to you know, compare it to all sorts of other types of objects as well. Things that, you know, in your if you're doing teaching and research, you never normally look at this kind of thing, whereas actually that can help you to mm-hmm. get to broaden your horizons a little bit more. You don't get quite so tunnel vision. You get the, the, the opportunity and the encouragement of that. Opening to broaden space. more, yeah. So that that's that's priceless. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much for joining us and for your patience. Um, oh, thank you, everyone in the chat for your patience as well. Um, I will be fixing the links that I've posted around the internet so that it actually redirects to the interview that succeeded. Um, So thank you again, everyone, for joining us. And remember, until next time, resist poor scholarship. Always ask, how do you know that?